ಡೀಲ್ ಪ್ಯಾಕ್ ಮಾಡಿಟ್ ಅಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟ್ ರಿಸ್ಕ್ ಸ್ಟಾಪ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಸ್ಟಾಕ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಸೊ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಫೇಸ್ಬುಕ್ ಬರ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಇದು ಓಪನ್ ಮಾಡಿಬಿಟ್ಬಿಡಿ ಫೇಸ್ಬುಕ್ ಇದೆ ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಮ್ ಬರ್ತದೆ ಅಂಡ್ ಗಿಂಡ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀರಾ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ದು ಎಕ್ಸಲೆಂಟ್ ಕಂಡೀಷನ್ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಇದೆ ಐತೆ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ಚೆಕ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀರಾ ಯೂಟ್ಯೂಬ್ ವರ್ಕಿಂಗ್ ಇದೆ ಮಾತ್ರ ಟಚ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಒಂಟಿ ಒಂದು ಸಿಸ್ಟಮ್ ಗೋಟ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಟ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾ 
ಅದೇ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಅಲ್ಲಿ ತನಕ ಹೌದು ಅಲ್ಲಿಂದಾನೆ ತಪ್ಪಿಸಿ ಅದು ಮನೆ ಒಳಗ್ ಮಾತ್ರ ಮೆಟಲ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಆ ಚಿಕ್ಕ ಪ್ಲಾಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಹಾ ಹೌದು ಅದ್ ಕಮ್ಮಿ ಆಗ್ಬಿಟ್ರೆ ಬರೋದೇಲ್ಲ ಪಕ್ಕದಲ್ಲಿ ಪಾಸ್ ಆಗಿದೆ ಒರಿಜಿನಲ್ ಆಡಿಯೋ ಹಾಕಿದ್ದಿದ್ದು ಯಾರು ನಾಯ್ಡು ನಾಯ್ಡು ಹಾಕಿದ್ದಿದ್ದು ಮನೆ ಕಟ್ಟುವಾಗ ನಾಯ್ಡು ಹಾಕಿದ್ದು ಒರಿಜಿನಲ್ ಅಲ್ಲೇ ಇರುತ್ತೆ ಅದು ಮೋಸ್ಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ಲಿ ಏನಾಗುತ್ತೆ ಅಂದ್ರೆ ಯಾವಾಗ್ಲೂ ಸಣ್ಣ ಪುಟ್ಟ ಕರೆಂಟ್ ಎಲ್ಲಾರು ವೀಕ್ ಬಂದ್ರೆ ತುಂಬಾ ಆಳಕ್ ಹಾಕಿದ್ರಲ್ಲ ಅದೇನಾಗುತ್ತೆ ನಾವು ಮೆಟಲ್ ಪೈಪ್ ಇದ್ರೆ ಅದು ಕಂಡೆಕ್ಟ್ ಮೇಲೆ ಬಂದ್ಬಿಡ್ಬೋದು ಅಂತ ಅನ್ಸುತ್ತೆ ಯಾಕಂದ್ರೆ ಆವಾಗ ಹಾಕಿದ್ದು ಚೆನ್ನಾಗಿತ್ತು ಅನ್ಸುತ್ತೆ ಪೈಪ್ ಅಷ್ಟು ಬೇಗ ತುಂಬಿಡ್ ಹಾಳಾಗಿರಲ್ಲ ಅಡಿಗೆ ಮನೆ ಕಿಟಕಿ ಕೆಳಗಡೆ
then we should talk to his sex and that that's so that is the magic part thing ah. if office gives me oh yeah. no no i will not take is it possible <laughs> And thank you one more time that you have just taken an advice. Then we can meet again, sir. Yeah, sir. Sir, so tomorrow morning, I'm not here. I'm busy moving. Am I training with which one? Which one? The Elisha. And uh, in our case, the Rupeshi is coming. Rupeshi will also be there. Yes, also be there. Ah, all the three will be there. Then uh, only Diksha will be coming in second shift. So the second shift possibly is not the problem. No, no, no. She will come in second shift. The worst case, she will not come also. Both the days. Yes, because she will sometime later uh, uh, send a message to no, you know, that uh, she is not available. Uh, sir, actually, we have a lot of meetings. So, so, meeting is ready. So, uh, so, 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 so No problem. No problem. I think that the checking even we can direct check. You can do that. But program time was still one, sir. You have to wait for time, sir. Because other. No problem, sir. Yes, sir. Maybe we can come here and check that actually. Yes, yes. Ask Dishar to call. Okay, sir. Okay. Because mobile most of the time off. Sir, sir. 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 Sir, s
So the duty of receiving him only tomorrow, or day after tomorrow. Ah, only tomorrow. Okay. So then our driver will automatically go there next day after tomorrow. Thank you. 
हेलो हाँ नमस्ते सर आई एम आई एम इन साइड द मीटिंग एंड माय वीडियो इज ऑन एंड माय म्यूट इज ऑफ सो दे कैन सी मी बट नो वन इज सेइंग एनीथिंग हाँ सर प्लीज आप आइए मैं हूँ मैं हाँ यहाँ हूँ ओके सर नमस्ते A very good afternoon to all the participants who have joined us this afternoon. Antibiotics, superbugs, and Ayurveda. Dear, dear participants, on behalf of National Council of Science, Science Museums and Vishesh Bharat Industrial Technological Museum, I would like, I would like to extend a hearty welcome, welcome, welcome to all, to all those, those who have joined, joined us in this, this afternoon's program for the, the webinar on the on the above topic. topic. As, As most of you are aware. The museum, the museum is is hosting an exhibition of super bugs and, and also, also trying, trying to convey the importance of use of, use of antibiotics in our daily, daily life. life. But then, then India, India is a is a country with a rich, with a rich heritage. heritage. We also, we also have, have our own system of system medicine, medicine, which is which is popularly known as Ayurveda. Ayurveda. As you all know, Ayurveda, Ayurveda is an alternative, is an alternative medicine, medicine system with historical, with historical roots in the Indian, in the Indian subcontinent. And the theory, and the theory of Ayurveda, of Ayurveda is, is scientific, scientific in nature, in nature and, and it's been followed been for, centuries. for centuries. Ayurveda, Ayurveda provides, provides us with the, the knowledge of how to treat diseases, diseases and how to eliminate, how to eliminate its, root cause. its root cause compared to allopathy, which tends to which focus, tends to on, focus the on the management, management of the diseases. Of the diseases. Yeah. With, this concert, with this concert, in our mind, in our mind today, today we, have with us, we have with us our guest speaker, our guest speaker Dr. Vashwati Bhattacharya. Madam, Madam, if you permit me, I will introduce you to the audience. वर्ल्ड And Dr. Dr. Bhaskar Bhattacharya was educated, was educated in Harvard, 
and she is a certified physician, physician trained in family medicine as well as preventive medicine. She divides, she divides her time between Manhattan, between Manhattan in US, in US and, Banaras and Banaras in India. In India. She, has she has published, published various, various books, books and is also, and one, is of also one of the best-selling best author, author in Ayurveda, in Ayurveda on various on works, various that, works she that she has done. Her work, Her work the, through the Acharya Institute, Institute focuses on focuses bringing, the, on bringing wisdom the wisdom and science of authentic, authentic traditional medicine, medicine such, as such as Ayurveda back to the, back hands, to the hands and arts of the people. Since 2003, Since 2003 she serves as, as clinical assistant professor, assistant of, professor of family medicine in the department, in the department of, medicine. of medicine at Cornell Medical, Cornell Medical, Medical in College in New York. In fact, in fact she is having, she multiple, is having PhDs. multiple PhDs. She has recently, she has recently completed, completed a PhD in Ayurvedic, in Ayurvedic chemistry, chemistry, pharmacetics, pharmacetics and, pharmacology, and pharmacology from Banaras, from Banaras University, Hindi University, focusing specially, focusing specially on polyherbal formulations, formulations for diabetics. She was also she recently, was also recently awarded, awarded a full bright specialist in global, in global public, public health, health specializing in integrative medicine. medicine. A documentary a film on our work, Healers Journey in Ayurveda. Was, was live, live on, the on the Discovery Channel, Channel worldwide. worldwide. Our first, Our first book, book, Everyday, Everyday Ayurveda, Ayurveda, is one of the national, national bestseller worldwide, worldwide published, published by, by Penguin Random House in 2015. Dr. Bhattacharya is basically a formalist in allopathic medicine in the USA, USA and, uh, and an expert in Ayurvedic chemistry and pharmacy from Banaras University. But I mean, if I keep continuing, your bio data it will be too long. So I am so short in here, here with, with apologies, apologies because, because we are short of short time. Of time. Madam, Madam, on behalf of the International Industry and Technological Museum, I would like to actually a warm welcome to you, Madam, for this afternoon's program. The participants are requested to kindly mute your audio and video during the presentation. During, During and after the talk, the participants may use the chat option, option to post their questions. Their questions. The, participant the participant joining through Facebook, Facebook may also may post, their, post their, their questions using the chat option. option. Now, now, I would, I would call, call upon Dr. Bhaswati Bhattacharya to take, to take the dayas, dayas and enlighten all, all of us on, on today's, today's topic, topic, namely, namely Morphs and Ecosystems, and ecosystems Antibiotics, Superbugs and Ayurveda. Madam, Madam, the stage, the stage is, yours. is yours. As I sign, As I sign off, off, waiting for, waiting your, for talk. your talk. Welcome Thank to you all once again. Once again, Madam. Thank you, Dr. Madan Gopal. Thank you very much. And welcome to all of you who are here. Am I audible? Yes, Madam. Yes, Madam. You are audible, Madam. Very good. So, I'm having some internet problems. I'm sitting in Udupi right now and uh, there are some delays. So, if you can't hear me, please type in the chat. I'll keep the chat open and we'll see if we can um, make sure to uh, keep the flow going. I'm going to opt not to use PowerPoint slides because it will slow down my speaking. But I think that you can follow. Yes? Sir, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a rotating wheel on my Mac, which tells me that I'm in some kind of uh, unstable condition. So I'm not sure. Um, what I'll do is I'll leave my phone's WhatsApp open. And Dr. Madan Gopal, if you can let me know, if you can't hear me, I will respond to that so that I have a form of uh, feedback. Because I'll invite you all if you want to turn on your videos um, so that I can interact with you. Because when I was in school in the US, in India, what we do is we come to class, we sit, someone comes to the front of the classroom, lectures to us, and leaves. But I did not go up that way. My uh, parents always taught me sitting in front of me. and. When I was in Gurukul, my guru would sit in front of me or the guru uh, bandhas, the guru friends 
uh, guru bandhu means yeah uh, f- like a colleague in your gurukul and uh, when i was at harvard everything was case based so it was interactive and my medical school was all interactive i didn't have a single lecture during medical school so i'm used to speaking in an interactive way and i hope that any of you who want to put on your videos will do so the topic today is purposefully provocative it's called wars versus ecosystems the melding of antibiotics superbugs and ayurveda and the topic uh, depends on people understanding each of them We are sorry for the interruption. There has been some uh, problem with the connectivity. We are just trying to connect you back to the speaker. Please hold on and bear with us till then.
Connectivity issues on my side or on your side? Madam, on your side, madam. Yeah. What's the last thing I was speaking about? Yeah, yeah. You have just started, madam, and I think uh, you were just giving the introduction part, and we can continue. Oh, I missed. Did you get to hear about uh, the gunpowder and the wars? Did you hear? You were able to start that, madam. Oh, ho. okay. I'll start again. So, sorry for that. This is one of our technology challenges. Uh, I'm going to just start again. So, the topic today is the wars versus ecosystems. And we're talking about antibiotic superbugs and Ayurveda. And I apologize for uh, things that I cannot control here, which is the internet in Udupi. Um, so, First, in this topic, we have to understand these words, right? So in Ayurveda, we call it paribhasha. It is understanding the vocabulary. So I had just started speaking about wars, and I'll just repeat what I said. So when we talk about wars versus ecosystems, we have to remember that wars are not just the wars that we know about, whether we are young adults or older adults, or whether we fought in the partition, you know, 70 some years ago, or World War II, but we also know wars from the times before gunpowder. Those wars are the wars that are waged every day for the last several millennia, actually thousands of millennia, which are waged in the forests between plants and between animals. So if you look at a plant, there's a sapling trying to grow in the forest. And it wages the war for survival because as it tries to grow, an animal can come and stomp on it and prevent it from growing. Or a vine can come and grow around it and secrete toxic chemicals as it's growing so that it will prevent the further growth of that tree. And so there's a war going on between those viruses, those poisonous plants, the trees that sometimes have poisonous chemicals in them, and they have to find a way to win that war and survive. In addition, there are animals. So we usually learn in school, in science class, about the food chain. So there's a big animal that eats the animal that it attacks, so that's called the predator, and that animal that it eats is called the prey. But that prey is also a predator of another animal that it ate to get big, which is the predator of another animal and another and another, till it goes all the way down the food chain to the smallest uh, animals, which are actually unicellular bacteria. So. created tools and created defense strategies so that we kill those lions and kill those tigers so that they can't attack us anymore and we can consider ourselves champions and now the humans are at the top of the food chain but if you think about this entire war that we have waged against other animals we cannot win a war if you are out of balance in the ecosystem. And I think we all know that with seven plus billion people on the planet everywhere, we are actually not ecologically balanced. We are affecting the climate, we are affecting the universe around us, whether it's the environment, as we call it, the water, the air, the plants, the trees, but we are adversely affecting many of the environments which we came into, which were very pristine and pure just 200 or 100 years ago. And by building dams and by building large power plants, we call it development, because, right? And because is superior. But if we don't do it in a balanced way, then we are creating a war with our environment and an imbalance in our ecosystems. And if we look at war, before it was waged uh, 100 years ago, I had just started talking about the Nobel um, uh, consequence. So Alfred Nobel, most of you know about the Nobel Prizes. 
Alfred Nobel had worked with gunpowder, and what he had done is created the artillery that then changed the entire game of war. Instead of to be close to someone and shoot them with an arrow and a bow, or with uh, a, throwing a rock at them, or fighting them hand on hand or with a sword. You could now stand very far away, like James Bond does, and shoot with a gun or with a rifle or with a shotgun or with a cannon or with these large um, substances. And if they were filled with gunpowder, not only would they have the impact that happens with quickness, but they would explode. And so with the chemicals, or just three chemicals inside of gunpowder, and put together, they create a reaction that explodes inside and kills people. Alfred Nobel invented this using the wonders of chemistry, but when he realized the danger of his invention, he became remorseful. And that sorry attitude, which we uh, would say here in India, is that he felt that he had done papa, led him to take all of his profits and say, I'm going to create where people can learn from my mistakes of giving gunpowder to the world. And so we created the Nobel Prizes. And that's what we all now worship as the greatest achievement in science. But actually, they are achievements sitting on the shoulders of a man who misused science against the ecosystem. So when you think about ecosystems in a larger way, you realize that man had been fighting war before, but when he used bow and arrow like they did in the Mahabharata or in um, the Ramayana, and when they use fighting with um, martial arts like they do in Kalari Payatu in Kerala, or the martial arts that we heard from Kalari Payatu up through the Shaolin monasteries across East Asia to China, Korea, Japan, and, and created in all the martial arts that you've heard of Kung Fu and Aikido and Bagua, those forms of fighting did not disturb the ecosystem. So war and ecosystem needs to be thought about at every point. If we go back to those forests and the way that they fought, plants are actually our greatest chemists on this planet. They make nanoparticles. They know how to harvest metals and put them in their own bodies. What we have is hemoglobin. All of you have heard of hemoglobin. It's filled with iron. So in a plant, they actually use more copper. Sometimes they use some of the other metals like molybdenum or magnesium. And they use that as a way of transporting oxygen and fluids and minerals throughout their body, through their blood vessels, which are called the xylem and phloem, mostly phloem. And they make these chemicals. And they make them so that they, and their wars are wars that are secreting toxins, as I mentioned earlier. So now we come to the other three words, super veda. Super bugs, as you all know, or if you haven't visited the exhibit, you should. The super bugs are the bugs that our antibiotics can't kill. So what are antibiotics? They are generally chemicals that have been isolated either from a laboratory formulation or actually there's an article in a, in a book called Biodiversity and Human Health in which a group of us analyzed the top 150 pharmaceutical drugs and found that most of those drugs, including the antibiotics, come from botanical origins. Botanical origins means any kind of plant, a tree, a shrub, and sometimes an animal, but usually botanical means the plants. Those antibiotics actually uh, have been isolated and are the basis of a lot of the pharmaceutical products that we sell. The first one, as most of you know, came from a fungus called penicillium and it secreted a particular chemical, which we call this penicillin. And penicillin was very much touted. There's an exhibit in the Superbus exhibition that talks about penicillin and how it came about. But it should be known that that fungus was actually not a plant. Fungi are a different new antibiotics. And as the antibiotics started developing, there were penicillins, there were next generation and next generation. Well. We are smart, but the bacteria were smarter. And the bacteria that said, we'll just change the way that that molecule kills us, they became more 
invincible, we can say. And when they became invincible, man said, fine, then we'll give two antibiotics, we'll give three antibiotics, we'll give four antibiotics. And they started increasing antibiotics and then they started changing the formulation so that two things that two different products would do would go into one molecule so that they could um, kill together. And so we had for a hundred years, not quite a hundred, because we started seeing problems within half a century. We knew that there were some problems of what we call resistance. Resistance means that the bacteria say, sorry, I don't want to die with your antibiotic. I am going to apply my own extra wall. So just as soldiers put on armor, the bacteria put on new armor and they created new proteins and new walls against those bacteria. So that's the overview of how the bacteria created defenses against the antibiotics that were designed to kill those bacteria. And those bacteria that have succeeded are called superbugs. Why? Because we can't kill them with our normal antibiotics that we've been using for 100 years. So you may have heard of MRSA. MRSA is M. RSA. It's methicillin, which is a type of penicillin. It's a, a sister of penicillin. Resistant, methicillin resistant. And then there's a bacterium called Staphylococcus aureus, which is a golden. Aureus means gold. Uh, Staphylococcus is a, a type of bacteria that uh, has kind of a gold colored um, uh, tinge to it. And also when it fights with the human bl um, white blood cells, the pus looks a little bit yellow as well from those bacteria. So Staph aureus that is resistant to the penicillin that used to die from is now called a superbug. So when people have MRSA infections, that means the Staphylococcus grows and starts eating out their entire body. That's kind of gross. And they die. And so this bug started spreading. And who does it attack? It won't attack you and me if we're healthy. It'll attack those sick patients that are already in the hospital. So if one guy is sick in the hospital and there's another guy near him and he catches that bug, then that created problems. And this was a big deal. And now there are VRE. There's a whole bunch of different uh, types of these super bug infections. So it's not that we want to understand the importance of using antibiotics. It's that we want to understand the importance of not overusing antibiotics. So you've noticed that I've been talking about bacteria. Well, there are other kinds of bugs. There are microscopic worms, which are called parasites. There are one-celled organisms that are bacteria, not bacteria, but they're slightly different in their, um, their structure. And there are viruses. And you guys have all been heard of hearing about viruses a lot in 2020 for some obvious reasons, right? So we all know that viruses are very different in their structure and in the way that they work than the bacteria are. And most antibiotics are against the bacteria. So a few years ago, actually now we look at about 40 years ago, there was a big virus that came through called the HIV virus, right? The human immunodeficiency virus. And most of the antibiotics that were tried on obviously didn't work because they were working for bacteria. So the viruses needed a different level of um, protection or of a way to kill those viruses. Sorry, we needed the protection that the viruses needed to be killed. And we weren't able to find it. So there was a second virus called the hepatitis virus, and there were a few antivirals. So they killed the viruses. And they tried them with hepatitis. With uh, they tried them on hepatitis. The, there were like six or seven different types of hepatitis, and they tried them with HIV, and they found that it didn't work. So there was a huge increase in funding to find new HIV antiviral drugs, and those became very quick. Resistance. So those are also kind of superbugs, but they don't really call them superbugs because in HIV we already knew from the beginning that that tendency to mutate, right, to change, to transform so that they have extra armor on them made them superbugs as well. So this idea of superbugs should be really clear to you now, and the idea of what antibiotics should uh, do should be very clear to you now. So Ayurveda, which is one of the areas that I have grown to really love and specialize in because I found how it works so well when modern medicine doesn't. It's allowed me to take my modern medical, 
white coat and stethoscope and black bag and add to it an entire group of other medicines that I'm going to now talk about. So Ayurveda looks at nature and looks at the patterns in the forests and the trees and it says, you know, those nanotechnologists that we just talked about earlier that are very good at killing uh, other predators, but doing it in a badass way. They don't use gunpowder and they don't use very, you know, bulldozers and big things that will kill everything. They're very pointed, they're very elegant, like a bow, an arrow. And they just go in and they kill only what's needed and leave everything else living. That is how trees keep the balance of the ecosystem while still fighting the war. So what Ayurveda has is knowledge of how those trees kill the bacteria and viruses and parasites and worms and fungi that come and try to latch on to their leaves or their stem or their bark or their roots. And as you know, trees can't just get up and walk over to the pharmacy or the medical store, right? So they have to make everything they need inside of themselves. So what do trees do? They draw their roots down into the soil, very deep, and they pull out those building blocks, those Lego blocks that they need in order to build what they would need to build, which are these complex molecules. And those building blocks and the blueprint for those is the genius of these nanotechnologists called trees. So I read them watch that and they said, you know, we notice that this particular plant doesn't get the same bug that everyone else does. Let's pick it out of the ground. Here's this beautiful red flower. I had a photo of my PowerPoint slides of this beautiful red flower on the stalk. And you pull it out and there's this bright orange kind of part that's just at the level of the soil and goes kind of deeper into the soil. It's called a rhizome. Can anyone guess what that rhizome is? Yes, it's turmeric. We call it haldi in Hindi. We call it kholu in Baba in Bengali. Or we call it haridra in Sanskrit. So turmeric has been found to have abundant antiviral, antibacterial, antiparasitic, and antifungal properties. And that's been done by microbiologists. And it's also been done experiments on humans because we know turmeric sitting in our kitchen, right? So we know that it works. And we can denigrate or insult all of the grandmas who have all those folk remedies. But the fact is that if you grew up on folk remedies, which you did if you're a real Indian, you know that anytime you came inside from playing and cutting yourself, you said, Ma, I have this pain here. I've cut myself. Right? Your mother would quickly take it, wash it in some water, and take her spoon of turmeric powder and just sprinkle it onto there, and you would have a yellow, you know, wound of war from the from the battle that you wage, and you go outside and show your friends and say, See, I got hurt. This is my turmeric that my mom put on it. That turmeric was not only an antibacterial, it was also a hemostatic, that means it stasis, stops, hemo, blood. Hemostatic means it, it's a blood stopper, so you wouldn't keep bleeding. And it's an anti-inflammatory, so you don't have to take any paracetamol. If you just put it there, your skin, which had been starting to swell, would just come down in swelling. In fact, it's also used in Bengal and in many parts of India that if you break a bone, you will see that there will be a lot of swelling in that area. So if you have nothing else, you can put some turmeric on that area. And it will bring down the swelling until you have time to go and either set the bone or go to a doctor and have it taken care of in a deeper way. And use of turmeric has also been added to another compound that is made in nature, which is called limestone or chun. Chun is that white stuff that you see those addicts of fawn putting on the betel leaf because it's got a very astringent property. It's like a whitish gray. So you mix that chun with some turmeric and you heat it up slightly and it turns from this bright orange to a bright red. And you put that on the place where your bone has broken and it will suck out the extra 
um, fluid, and fluid is what allows the bacteria to grow. So these kind of what we call home remedies or folk remedies or grandmother's remedies are actually science. They are chemistry and they are evidence-based chemistry because people have been watching how they work, repeating it. It's replicable and they've been seeing that actually this is a really great way to affect uh, antibiotic what shall we say? I, I don't want to use the word antibiotic because that usually refers to a pill. It's a way to fight bacteria from growing in the system. So Ayurveda uses turmeric. It also uses uh, many other plants that have antibiotic properties. So another one you must know is neem. Everyone has seen the neem tree. Neem grows throughout India, right? Its botanical name is Azadiracta indica, but we don't say that word unless we're in America. We say neem because everyone knows neem. And in neem, we can use the leaves, we can use the bark, we can use the stems, and we can use the root, but we don't because it's within the tree. So if you take some of the bark, the chai, as it's called, or the twak, the chai of that is taken and it is boiled, and the liquid that comes out from it that's soluble in the water is very, very good to drink. It's also good to put as a... You can soak um, cotton in it, so you can call it like a poultice. It's not a poultice, it's a pichu. How will I say that in English? It's basically cloth dipped in that medicinal fluid, and you can put it on skin lesions or rashes, and the neem has a powerful antibacterial. So these all have chemical names that you can go and learn. You can go online and just search neem antibiotic chemicals, and you'll find them. But the point is that these azadiractocides, as some of them are called, these chemicals have potent antibacterial properties. So when people have lice in their hair or scabies, which is a bug, a, a very small bug that grows in the hair, right? It's a, it's a, a hair infection. Or if they have a rash from a bug bite or a small insect bite, if you just take some of that neem and you put it there, or you take the leaf and you pound it and you take that oil and water that comes out from that leaf, it's called swara. Swa means self, ras means fluid. So it's the self-contained fluid in that, in that leaf. You can make that and make put it on as a lepa. Lepa is a Sanskrit word for poultice. These are different ways that neem is used. We can also take the stem, split it in half the long way, hand the other half to a friend, take that half and, and suck on it and bite on it and use it as a morning toothbrush. And it will actually get rid of all the bacteria that are lining the uh, gingiva, which is the area between the gums and the teeth. And it makes your teeth cleaner than any, really any other. There's bubble, there's kadira, and there's neem. These three branches are the ones that we use in India for the last few thousand years. And if you see the people that use it, they don't lose their teeth at the age of 90. Whereas if you go to the countries that use toothpaste with antibacterial chemicals, you're losing their teeth at the age of 50 and getting dentures. So Ayurveda has washed for thousands of years to see these different chemicals in these plants in the forest that themselves produce the chemicals so that they did not have to, they couldn't walk over to the pharmacy, but they also didn't have to go begging and borrowing from anywhere. They just made the chemicals within themselves. If you want to boost or fortify your own immune system, there's another herb called guduchi. So if there's a plentitude of, let's say, viruses, some, some unknown virus in the environment that you might or might not catch, then if you fortify your immune system with guduchi, guduchi is botanically called tinospora cordifolia, but guduchi is a Sanskrit name. And in Hindi, it's called giloi, or you can hear gilroy. There's a few different names in different parts of India for guduchi. And guduchi can be found in medicines, at least 15 or 20 common formulations. So these are some of the plants. The second part was actually what my PhD thesis uh, worked on, which was called Bhasma. So in Bangla, we say Bhasho. In Hindi, we say Bhasma and, or Bhasa in Hindi, and then Sanskrit Bhasma. Bhasmas are metals and minerals which are taken and they are heated up on a fire, just like you heat up a stone. 
and then they are dropped into first an acid and then heated again, dropped in the acid, heated again, dropped in the acid seven times. Every stone has a different way and a different kind of recipe for how to pull out the actual metal. After that, it's thrown into more of a basic substance. So, for example, we can use um, the kanji, the, the uh, uh, water above the rice, right? The very soupy kind of rice. We can use uh, kulata kwat. We can use a decoction of a particular bean that's called kulata. It's a kind of dal. It's a gram uh, that we use. We can use gomutra, which is the, the uh, urine of cows, female cows, right? We can use so many different of these um, solvents or these different liquid solutions. And we dip the metal into it. And each metal has a different way of being extracted. And this is the process of, it's the first of many processes, but the whole process is called sattva patana, bringing out the sattva or the essence. So when we purify these metals using these process, dipping, heating, dipping, heating, dipping, heating, one process takes 35 cycles. So that's at least, you know, to heat it and, and quench it in the cooling and do it again. It will take you a minimum of, you know, seven or 10 days just to do that one rock. So people take collections of rocks together, like a kilo of rocks or two or five or 10 kilos and dip them together and bring them out and dip them. So if you've ever watched this process, it is very scientific, it is very elegant, but the starting material varies. It's not the same because rocks from different parts of the world are different. Once you take that out, then you have small, small, small rocks. The rocks actually fall apart. Even a big, thick rock, even a piece of concrete will fall apart because of that cycling. Then you put it in heat and this is extreme heat like what's used to purify iron and steel. So we're talking 600, 800,000 degrees of temperature. And there are distinct musa. Musa is the, the crucible or the instruments that are used. And there are putas, which are these big ovens that are made. And if you go to Benares in the university where I worked on my PhD, the... Um, the head of department who was there for many decades, Dr. Chandrabhushan Jha, he's actually a living legend of how to make, how to take these rocks and make bhasmas and then give them to patients. And he's been doing this for over 40 years. So I went and studied with him. And when you put them in the incineration, you take them out, they slowly start moving from being a big rock into being a smaller particle that's a millimeter in size. And then you do the cycle again and they become a micrometer in size, which is 10 to the minus six. And then you do it a few more times and it becomes 10 to the minus nine, which is a nanoparticle. And so what we find in these big rocks that have now been burned again and again and again is that they become nanoparticles, which means that they can penetrate into our bodies and they can actually have an osmotic effect and they can affect the bacteria. So. To finish this story, I mean, it's a very long story, but just to, to um, finish this introduction to it, we, between each cycle, grind it again and again with plants that are specifically known for different effects. So if you're trying to have an antibiotic effect, you could use those neem leaves or the neem bark to crush with that metal. And what you'll create is a very effective antibiotic, which has metals in it, that those plant um, enzymes and plant components from the tree that you used are going to capture those metals. And then when they're incinerated, those metals are going to become smaller and smaller and smaller. And when they're delivered to the human body, they have amazing effects. So in Ayurveda, what we've been using for antiviral, if anyone has a fever that they cannot control in the very beginning and they're starting to get a dry cough, or they're starting to have respiratory symptoms, immediately we give them something called Jayamangala Ras. Jayamangala Ras is found in any Ayurvedic um, dispensary or store. You should go to an Ayurvedic doctor to make sure that that's the right one. But every Ayurvedic doctor, of which there are 600,000 in India and maybe about 5,000 outside of India, they know 
how to give these medicines because they are among the best antibiotics out there for viruses and I shouldn't say antibiotics, I should say antiviral because they're really working on viruses as well as bacteria. So between husmas and buduchi and neem and turmeric and there's a few others like kalmeg and um, there are actually, I think I'm trying to remember the exhibit, I think there's about 12 different plants that you can go and read about at the exhibit. And when you're there, you'll see a video that talks about it, and you'll see some outlines of each of those plants that will introduce you to the world of the natural ecosystem and the natural warriors, bows and arrows, which are here to help us get over this immense problem we're having with superbugs. There is one problem that you have to remember, though. You see, the antibiotics make a lot of money for the pharmaceutical companies. And so there are many of them who do not want to see you using neem or turmeric because you're not going to end up buying a 50 rupee pill if you can just go out to your backyard and get a tree and use your neem leaves. So there's a whole, what shall we say, discussion going on that's not so friendly between the Ayurvedic doctors that say, yes, we want to use our plants, and the people who want to use drugs will say, no, these are quicker and better for us if you use them. And that is something that I think the common person can understand and say, well, there are times when we should use antibiotics, where it's very important and it's a life-saving measure. And I, as a, as a doctor, have prescribed thousands of antibiotics. But there are also times when these antibiotics only create superbugs. And that is what this exhibit is trying to teach you, that please don't create more superbugs. Know when to use the antibiotics and know when not to pop them like gems candies, but instead use some of the herbals so that you don't create superbugs. So I am going to end here. I'm sorry that I haven't been able to see any um, questions, but uh, maybe, sir, you can help me if there are any questions on the chat. And I thank you all for listening to me and for participating. Namaskar. Uh, namaskar, madam. And uh, since it's been a wonderful experience where you have taken us through, starting from the gunpowder and uh, how plants fight against the microorganisms by developing their own chemicals and how we can harvest those chemicals for our benefit. And I'm happy to note that you started off with uh, the gunpowder and talked about superbugs, antibiotics, Ayurveda, and the importance of some of the uh, I, uh, things like turmeric, limestone, and then the way uh, the turmeric and uh, lime, uh, turmeric is useful as antibacterial drug, antiviral drug, antifungal drug, antimicro drugs, obviously, etc. It's a whole lot of uh, information that you have passed on to us and also uh, we are happy to note that you spoke on the way the baspas are made at the nano level through which this can uh, enter into our skin and act on our thing and including of course the Kurota and Gomutra and uh, all those things. Madam, it was really very enterprising uh, listening to all of you but then uh, madam, uh, we, uh, I'm just seeing a question on the chat board and I'm sure you must also be seeing this uh, question. The question is something like this. I heard that the dandruff in its scalp is caused by some bacteria and also causes the air fall. So what would be the best Ayurvedic remedy for such bacterial infection? This is the question that just come up uh, on the chat box, madam. So thank you to Miss or Mr. Vishwanath for asking this question. Uh, dandruff is different for different people. Yes, it is true that sometimes it's because of bacteria, but it's more true for people to have dandruff when they don't take care of their dinacharya, which means their daily routine. We should wash our hair every day. Now, I know that the French didn't wash their hair because they had fancy hairdos, and so they would just put powder and wigs and things on their hair. But in India, we put oil in our hair and we wash our hair. So it's important that you wash your hair with water every day. And when it gets too sweaty or too dirty because you've been playing outside or you're working on a farm, on those days, you should do something to clean your scalp. 
And if and you don't do that, that is what causes the infections, the infections and the eventual presence of dandruff, dandruff and maybe even the bacteria, the bacteria that come in and say, wow, wow there's all this there's dandruff, it's good food for us, we can eat this. So to, to, to prevent the beginnings of this, um, I'm sorry, there's some background noise. If you could just mute, someone is uh, off mute. Um, so if you start out and you look at what's going on in your scalp and you say, okay, there's just dandruff, then you can just put some oil on your hair overnight or even for one or two hours and then wash it. But you don't want to wash it with this very drying shampoo. Most of the shampoos use something that's non-greasy, which is called paraffin, and it ruins the hair and that's why a lot of people get hair fall. And so a lot of these brand name uh, shampoos, if you can turn around the back and read those ingredients, if you can't even pronounce those ingredients, then there's a problem. So what Ayurveda says, well, I'll give you the easiest. There's about five or six things you can do, but the easiest is to get green gram, right? Mugdal. So mugdal in the green form is if you take off the shell, it becomes yellow inside. So you take the green whole mugdal, you can buy it, it's like 40 rupees a kilo. And you put it through a grinder, either Krishna yourself or put it through a, a, a mixing or a blender and make fine powder from it. Then you take about a tablespoon of that and you put it in some water and make it a thick consistency like a shampoo consistency, right? Liquid shampoo consistency. And you just put it all over your hair for five or 10 minutes and then you wash it out. And if you do that for the first one week, it'll feel weird because you'll feel like there's extra oil coming up. And the reason is because people who shampoo their hair every day with commercial shampoo deplete the natural oils that hold onto the hair follicle. And so it gets super dry. So the body tries to put out more oil to replenish that. But if you stop depleting it from the end, right, from the shampoo, then that extra oil doesn't need to be produced. So it takes about a week to do that. And then after about a week, you'll notice that your hair actually stops graying, stops falling out, and uh, is much more moist at the hair from it and is stronger and doesn't break. Now, this does not always apply for people with um, Genetic pattern baldness, the one that men get and sometimes starts showing up at the age of 30 or 40. But I'm talking about the hair fall that it seems like you're talking about. If there are bacteria there, then a very good thing to do is to take that neem, that those leaves I was talking about, and put that in your hair for just five minutes. And then wash it out with that green gram doll. And if you do that several times, let's say you do it once every other day for a week, you should notice that the itching goes away and that the um, the breakage and the dandruff go away. If it doesn't, you should just go find an Ayurvedic doctor who's going to look at your scalp, which you can't do because you can't get up there. Look at your scalp and then is going to give you a nice herbal preparation that doesn't include commercial shampoo. And that usually takes care of it. Now, if it's that you have hair lice or scabies or another thing, then you need to have a professional look at your hair. You shouldn't be doing this on, on your own because as you know, lice and bed bugs and all are very uh, contagious. So I just want to end by saying Ayurveda does not treat an infection or a disease. Ayurveda treats the patient. And because every patient is different, you can't just say for this disease, this medicine. It'll work some of the time, like let's say 20% of the time, but people are different. And so treating a hair infection in a child is different than in an elder. Treating a hair infection in someone who has diabetes is different from treating someone who doesn't have diabetes or treating someone that's taking certain medicines like antibiotics is different from treating someone who hasn't taken those. So it's an overview, but you should definitely try for the first week to use these neem uh, remedies. And I hope that that helps you, um, Vishwanathji. Madam, thank you. Uh, you know, we are also live on the YouTube, and there are some questions on the YouTube. Uh, if you permit me, I would just like to uh, take those questions on, uh, ask you those questions. Okay. okay. The first question is, Madam, 
Uh, you know, we are uh, all talking about the antibiotics and um, since all the uh, allopathic antib antibiotics that have been developed are no more working on the bugs. Now, from the Ayurveda side, you talked about neem and turmeric. These are also antibiotics as far as Ayurveda is concerned. Now, uh, why don't we switch on to this uh, Ayurvedic uh, antibiotics for treating the discussions is one of the questions. Why don't we switch on to treating uh, with neem and these antibiotics for what disease? For what, uh, you mean in general? In general. Well, when they do. You know, I actually don't use a lot of allopathic medicines in my practice and my patients that come to me do not come to me for uh, antibiotics. Yes, I can write prescriptions and I paid a lot of money to get the right to do so. But I find that most of the time it doesn't help the patient as well long long term as using some of these herbs. So I recommend herbs actively to patients who want to use them. But the thing is that you have to want to use them. And that is dependent on how you were brought up. To be honest, there most of us who are Indian had Oh, at least her grandparents or great grandparents, everyone was using Ayurveda because English medicine wasn't really in India until the 18 something, right? The late 1800s. And so our grandparents, grandparents, grandparents for sure were using Ayurveda. But some of our ancestors decided that they want to use very modernized things because it's very cool, you know, to to ride around on a motorcycle and have the latest uh, iPhone and have the gadgets. So to use neem and turmeric, it's considered to be primitive, backwards, simpleton, uh, you know, farmer, rural, and uneducated. And those kind of ideas that we have about Indian traditional medicines is exactly what the British wanted of us. And it's exactly what people who say that, why don't we know about this? You are the victims of exactly that. So what you have to do is go and start reading about these things because we're so blessed. Every single person can go out and find neem and turmeric and guduchi if you want to, and you can start getting educated very quickly. So the question of why don't we use them in general is that you don't use them in general. Many people do use them in general. And in fact, the World Health Organization says that traditional ancient medicines are used by more than half of Indian people for their medical and health care. Uh, madam, let us take the next question, madam. Uh, it's one, uh, I think, Neha Ranga. Uh, this is uh, regarding one of the uh, Government of India's decision recently wherein the Government of India is permitting Ayurvedic doctors to perform some of the surgeries to a limited extent and probably you know Charaka Samhita talks about a lot of these things. Now our question is, is it good to allow Ayurvedic doctors to perform operations now? Is it a good step? This is one of the questions. I don't know whether it is the right question or not. It's but a it's not a thin All right, so, so I'll, I'll read that. First, it's the Sushruta not the Chalaka Samhita that talks about surgery primarily. Yeah. Chalaka does do some procedures, but if you want to understand surgery, you should look at the Sushruta Samhita. Sushruta was a physician in Varanasi, which is my uh, place where I live. So we learn a lot about Shushruta. And Shushruta is considered to be the first surgeon because he took the time to write a book about how to do surgery. As it happens, every Ayurvedically trained physician at a BAMS, Bachelor of Ayurvedic Medicine and Surgery School in India, learns surgery. And for the last 40, 50 years, they have been permitted to do certain surgery procedures. So that's been going on. What wasn't in the law before was it wasn't specifically stated that these are the operations that they commonly do. So the law just decided that it's better for us to just delineate the operations that they're already doing and just put them down on paper. And that inflamed the modern medical doctors of allopathy who feel that it's unfair 
for Ayurvedic surgeons to suddenly start doing surgery, but they're not suddenly doing it. When I was at BHU, I was learning surgical techniques from the OP gynae doctors and the surgeons. And there are certain surgeries that Ayurvedic doctors have been doing for a hundred years, which are superior to the treatment of certain diseases that are considered incurable by modern medicine, such as fistulas down near the rectum. They are not really curable by modern medicine. There are also certain cancers that are treated with surgery in modern medicine where they create a lot of side effects. But when Ayurveda does them, it doesn't because they use plants and herbs as a preparation and in the course of the surgery. And there are a lot of women's conditions such as fibroids that are better treated by surgical procedures of Ayurveda. These have been going on for millennia, but suddenly the allopaths became aware of it and so they have been speaking out. That's part one. Second part is that many of the antibiotic uh, problems that happen in surgeries are why the surgeries go bad, both in America and here. You know, I was uh, trained in surgery uh, uh, in uh, New York, and we would have complications from antibiotics and unexpected infections. If you use plant-based herbs and decoctions of those herbs, as I described earlier, many times you avert the side effects of those infections. And that's an important addition for any patient that wants the best outcome. Last, I just want to say about the surgeons that Surgeons should understand that Ayurvedic doctors are not all going to get up right now today and start becoming surgeons. The ones that are already surgeons are going to get training. And I, as an allopathic doctor, can tell you that in India, there are plenty of allopathic surgeons who are not that good. So to raise a bar for everyone to have to do surgery in a higher standard is really good for the patient. It's not against modern medicine and it's not against Ayurveda. Everyone should get certified for competence and that is what these, these recent laws are trying to do. But everyone is spinning it to make it seem like it's Ayurveda against allopathy. If we just focus on the patient, we just do what's best for the patient. Thank you, madam. The next question, madam, uh, is from Mr. Vino. He says, Madam, I have a copy of your book, Everyday Ayurveda, and I love reading it. So, could you please, could you please suggest uh, some uh, uh, remedies for reducing the blood cholesterol? So, everyone has blood cholesterol for a different reason. You have to go and check with an Ayurvedic doctor as to exactly why it's happening. There are many things that the doctor will do, but the first thing that uh, the Ayurvedic physician will do is she or he will give you something to clean your gut. So you should first get a sense, watch yourself for a few days and see how is your appetite? Do you have a good solid appetite? What's your food pattern? What's your bowel movements pattern? Do you have a nice thick brown banana every morning when you wake up? Or do you have, you know, little marbles or little pebbles or little pencils? What's your bowel movement like? If you're not clearing your bowels, there's a problem in your gut and that has to be fixed. There are about, oh, I think I use maybe 20 or 30 different remedies depending on the patient. I also look at the sleep cycle, I look at your emotional stresses, I look at how tired you are, and I take these six, seven factors, I put them together, and then I check to see what you actually need in order to reduce the cholesterol. Usually it's a cleaning out of your ranjakapitta, which means your liver's metabolism. And that's very easily done by a good liver remedy. But you have to pick the right one. So just going out and getting Liv 52 or Liv Tone is fine if you just want to start somewhere. But you should really see an Ayurvedic doctor so that you bring your cholesterol up. Uh, sorry, bring your cholesterol back to balance. Bring your HDLs up while making the whole um, body function because what you don't want is for your numbers to look good but you feel terrible right so that's my um, that's my response to you and thank you for reading everyday ayurveda well no, i'm just uh, taking up the last question here sure. in india we indians eat quite a lot of carbohydrates almost three times in a day yes does our body really need that much of carbohydrates 
So it's not about carbohydrates, it's about the processing of carbohydrates and what those carbohydrates do to your body. So we look at something called the gunas, the qualities. If that carbohydrate is purely harvested, purely cultivated, purely harvested, and purely brought to market, it's not going to make you gain weight, it's actually going to build up your health. So uh, rice for Indians is one of the best. So if you live in the north and you're indigenous to the areas that grow wheat is good, moong dal is good. These are the three that are considered to be the best foods and then pure cow's milk. Now, with each of these, there are problems because as commercial, you know, the farmers, right, they harvest things, but then those groups that purchase those foods change them around and put preservatives to keep bacteria from growing in them. Preservatives are anti-life. And when we swallow that anti-life, our fire gets changed in our body, our digestive enzymes. And so we end up not being able to process those carbohydrates and proteins well. And that's why we have health problems. So if you're an actual farmer growing the food, or if you can make friends with a farmer and purchase your rice and your uh, wheat, your goduma, your dal from those people and then bring them home and cook them yourself, you're going to find that it's not about the carbs, but those particular foods are super healthy for you and keep you well. And if you don't understand these, go to a grandmother or a very old person that's at least 80 years old and they will tell you about these foods and how it doesn't matter about carbohydrates, fats and proteins. It matters how you digest it. Dr. Gopal will eat something and maybe he won't gain a single gram of weight. Someone else, like me, might eat it and I'll gain two grams of weight. And someone else will eat it and they'll gain a kilo of weight. Why? It's not about the carbohydrate. It's about the way that you digest the food. Ayurveda calls that jathar agni. Jathar agni is that ability that your gut has to take whatever you feed it and to transform it, take out the nutrients and send them to your tissues in the correct way to build up your body and your body's strength. So Ayurveda teaches you not to worry about the carbohydrates, but to focus on the game of agni in your body. Agni is that digestive fire. Thank you for your question. Well, uh, uh, we know uh, we are forced to take one more question and uh, I'm sorry if I'm troubling you too much. Uh, well, the question uh, is something like this. Uh, in order to boost the immune system in our body, there are several herbal tea ingredients which are in the market. What's your opinion on this? Well, some of the teas are very good. Absolutely. And it's wonderful um, that they are there, but they shouldn't be used as teas, some of them. They should be used as decoction. So you should put in four times the water, add the herb, and let it boil down to evaporating three-fourths of the water, so one-fourth of it is left. So if you start with a liter, you should have 250 mLs left. In that process, whatever is left in those, uh, of those herbs, you can drink that. That is very good for you. And people in different parts of the country have different herbs that work. Uh, we've been using it this year in 2020 for obvious reasons. And I certainly think that having ginger and black pepper and buduchi, which I mentioned before, and yashti madhu, which is called bhaguleti in the north. It's a licorice in English. Um, these are all different options. Which ones to put together depends on which symptoms you have. And yes, the teas, many of them are made for your convenience and they're excellent, but you need to know about the herbs. If you're an older person that knows about the herbs or a young person who loves studying the herbs, you already know which tea to use. So yes, the teas are great, but if you don't know what to do, and you're buying it the way you would just buy any kind of you know, new product, then you need to go and get educated. Please bring Ayurveda back into your life. It's your birthright, it's part of your genes, and it is a really great tool against the superbugs epidemic, pandemic that we have, if you use it. If you don't use it, those teas are not useful, uh, they're not really worth anything, unless you understand the wisdom in the tea. Thank you, sir. Oh, oh, thank you very much, madam. I think we are running short of time. And uh, finally, on behalf of National Council of Science Museums and Visheshwara Industrial Technological Museum, uh, uh, today's speaker, Dr. Baswati Bhattacharya, has spared our valuable time and spoke in length about the various aspects of Ayurveda 
and madam we are really in debt to you for finding your time and sparing your valuable time with us this afternoon on behalf of this organization i would like to thank you madam for being with us and also throwing light on the most important aspect of the traditional medicine of india named the ayurveda and also encouraging us to make ayurveda as part of our lifestyle from today onwards at least madam thank you thank you for this and i'd like to also thank all the participants for having joined us this afternoon for this evening's talk and for uh, asking questions to the madam and i'm sure as madam expects all of us let's make ayurveda part of our life from today so with this concluding remarks i would like to sign off and thank the speaker dr prashanti bhattacharya once again for a valuable time and throwing it on various aspects of ayurveda all the participants for joining us this afternoon thank you madam thank you all the participants good day ಮಾಡ್ಬೇಕಾ ಎಂಡ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಬಿಟ್ಬಿಡಿ ಸರ್ ಬಿಟ್ಬಿಡಿ